Hi, everyone. Thank you to be here at this almost final session of the day. Uh, my name is Johnny Hoibergs. I'm from Belgium. And today I want to talk about controlling my home sauna using .NET 6 uh, and MAUI. Um, as I told you, I'm from Belgium. I'm a developer. I work as a consultant for involved consultancy firm in Belgium. Belgium. Um, and basically, today I just want to uh, give you some inspiration on what I'm doing in my free time. So in my free time at home, I'm building all kinds of tools. My wife is quite tech savvy also, so she likes that I'm helping our home to be a little bit more smart without it costing too much money. Um, so yeah, I will uh, guide you through that and hope you, you will be uh, inspired by that. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask me, uh, but you can also contact me on my social media uh, or on my email address um, as, you, as you like. I'm, I would be very happy to, to answer your questions. So what is um, the session going to look like? Uh, first, I will give you some context on what is actually happening at our home and, and why did I, I had the idea of creating this application. Um, I will talk about the .NET 6 application templates and workloads that I've been using to do all of these things, like the web API and the worker service. Not in detail, because I suppose that most of you know how these templates work, but I just want to show you how I used them specifically for this use case. Um, I've actually made this um, application a couple of years ago already, so I was using Xamarin Forms. So I would also like to share my experience with migrating from Xamarin Forms to Maui. What what are the differences? What went wrong? Uh, so that hopefully you 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 get some help from that. I want to talk about the architecture. Um, how how did I do it? Uh, give you that deeper dive into Maui, and then finally. Uh, take a sneak peek into the Blazor hybrid or uh, Maui using Blazor um, templates. So let's start with some context. So I live in a very small home uh, in Belgium. Small home means not so expensive, means I still had some money lying around to buy a sauna. So my wife asked me, um, we really should have a sauna in our, in our back garden. Um, so, we, so we bought this one and it's, it looks rather mo modern. I think, uh, glass and, and, and metal, met, metal coloring. Um, but basically when you look inside, on the left hand side, there was a very tiny screen to set the temperature. And it's 2022. This had one line of uh, segmented LCD display. That doesn't work for me. Um, also, I don't know if you noticed on the previous slides, but we live in what is called in Belgium a bel étage, which means we live on the first floor. I'm a developer, I'm lazy. I don't want to go running outside to see if the sauna is already at temperature or not. So I want to be able to see this remotely, which was also not an option. Um, so yeah, the sauna got installed. It took a few weeks. I opened the electronic box uh, and I was looking at, how does this work? I could see two very large electronic switches, electrical switches. The big one is for the Finnish sauna stove little thing. I don't know how to call that in English, uh, like with the rocks on top and you can pour water over it. So that's the big one. And then the small one is for the infrared panel. So we have infrared panels in all the walls and in the benches. Um, so actually we can use it either way, uh, not, not together, but either way. So we can choose um, to use infrared or to use the Finnish sauna. So that's very easy, that is just 220 volts on or off, very nice. Um, and then this board had some wires connected to it. And I actually found out that these bottom two wires were used for the temperature sensor. It was inside of the sauna. So at the ceiling level, there's like a small little sensor and that was connected with two wires. Um, one for data, one for power. Um, and that's basically it. That's very simple concept, how a sauna works. The board just measures the temperature and based on the temperature it will turn on or turn off those big switches. So I needed to do something in order to um, make this remotely accessible. So the first thing that I did was, and you actually can already see it here, pasted some very ugly strips, the top and the bottom, so I could paste a very cheap, um, so put a very cheap tablet on top of that and now it already looks much nicer. So this is the Xamarin uh, forms, or this was a Xamarin Forms application running on an Android uh, tablet, showing me the temperature very large, so no more segmented LCD displays, uh, the remaining time of the current session, and so on. Then I put another electronic box next to the one that's already there, 
Um, and this is just a proof of concept. Today it actually looks uh, a bit nicer, um, but I put a Raspberry Pi inside. And that Raspberry Pi has some uh, ge generic input-output ports, which I could connect to a couple of LEDs, but also these very small switches. These very small switches, you can switch them based on 3.3 uh, volts. So you put 3.3 volts on them and they switch on, you take the voltage away and they switch off. So I use these little switches connected to the big switches in this box in order to turn them off or on. So the, the Raspberry Pi does not work with 220 volts, it works with 5 volts and 3.3 volts. So this is low voltage, but they, connected, they are connected to the high voltage switches right here. So my Raspberry Pi can switch on or switch off those big switches by using the small switches, basically. And then you can also see in the top that white wire is actually containing um, those two wires that come from the temperature sensor. So I could also connect that to the Raspberry Pi and actually read the temperature from the sauna uh, that way. Now the app itself is very simple. Mm -hmm. I started by using um, the app that I created. Then it shows the current temperature in the sauna. On the top is the outside temperature, just for information. On the top right is the power usage. And in the bottom you can start a sauna session or start the infrared session. Another um, thing that I tried is when I add some music, when I turn on some music, that it's also displayed within that application. So I have an application on my Android device to play audio via Bluetooth. There's Bluetooth speakers inside of the sauna. Uh, and when I go back to the application, it also automatically shows the current, uh, current track that is playing. If you start the session, it counts down by default. It's one hour, the remaining session time. Um, and it will also show um, the, the power usage in the top. That's just because I'm a developer. I know I make mistakes, so I just want to see if it's using power, yes or no. And then in the bottom, you can see that there's a graph showing me the, 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 the temperature. So that's basically the idea. That's what I created. And this is what I want to share with you today and, and how I exactly did that. So first, it all runs on .NET 6. I'm actually very happy um, that .NET 6 today is so easy to use. Uh, I've been using I've been using .NET since it came out in 2002, basically, and it really feels like today things are so easy for us developers, especially for creating these kinds of applications. Um, so the, the idea is that I used a web API because I wanted to do planning, I wanted to do session planning. So instead of turning on the sauna immediately, I also want to be able to plan a session for tonight, for example. So I could say I want to go in the sauna tonight at 6 p.m., uh, the temperature should be 100 degrees Celsius, um, so the sauna knows this and it can already heat beforehand so that it's at 100 degrees at 6 p.m. So that's why I needed the API, so that I, I, could be, I was able to talk to the API, send data to the API, which is stored in the database. And also the, the, um, the algorithm itself can learn from previous sessions in that database, because in the winter it takes longer to heat up and, uh, up to 100 degrees in the, in, the, in the summer, of course. So I can also learn from that data. Um, I'm also using worker services. Uh, worker services is like a console application that does, that does a long running task in the background. So I'm using that on, on the Raspberry Pi itself. So on the Raspberry Pi, there's the worker service running and it constantly looks at the temperature. Um, and whenever it needs to do something, it will talk to those generic input output ports. The cool thing about a worker service uh, template in .NET 6 is that it is just a console application, so it's very easy to test, but you can install it as a Windows service or as a Linux daemon. So I'm actually running um, a Linux distribution on top of that Raspberry Pi, a Raspbian, um, and there it runs my uh, Linux daemon service. And finally, the Raspberry Pi has those generic input-output ports. .NET 6 has a NuGet package available from Microsoft, an official NuGet package that you can use to interact with those ports. So you can read from them, you can write values to them, um, so you can do whatever you want with them by just using this, uh, this package with the generic uh, input-output ports. And then finally, First did it in Xamarin Forms, now it's in, uh, it's in uh, Maui, so I will also show you uh, in a minute what that looks like. The architecture is very simple, I already talked about that. In the top you have the HTTP API, which connects to the database, the Android app connects to the HTTP API, and you can use this both for the tablet inside of the sauna, but you can also use it on your phone when I'm upstairs in the living room, so I can see the same uh, user interface on my 
on my uh, mobile phone. There's the processor which lives on the Raspberry Pi, which talks to the temperature sensor or reads from the temperature sensor, and it um, switches those electronic switches. Technology-wise, um, this is a Raspberry Pi 3. It runs the Linux daemon. I already talked about that. It's a worker service, but it's also a gRPC server to do real-time communication with the API. So basically, um, when I'm connected to the API, I can read the current temperature in the sauna live um, instead of polling it, um, which was just an experiment from me. The temperature sensor works with the one-wire bus protocol. Basically, if you want to do something like this at home, just read whatever component you want to use, read the serial number, Google the serial number, and you will find lots of information about how it works. In this case, the temperature sensor was using the one-wire bus protocol, and if you connect that to a Linux, it automatically um, notices it, and it will create a little folder that is mounted, and within that folder is a simple text file. And whenever you read that text file, you are reading the current temperature. So it's very easy to, to read the temperature from that sensor. don't really need it to do a lot of weird things just reading a text file. And then the GPIO, it's just putting a value 0 or 1 on a port to enable it or disable it. Um, so maybe before talking about MAUI, I will very quickly show you the solution, or at least the Visual Studio solution. So indeed, I have the API, and uh, something that I also like about uh, .NET 6 is the fact that you have these top-level programs. There's still a lot of usings which I could use um, the implicit usings for, but there's no more namespace, there's no more um, main method and stuff like that. I said I like it. In this case, I like it because this is a very simple project uh, and everything is in that program.cs file, all of that configuration. Um, and it's only 70 lines of code, so that's okay. But if you have like larger applications that need lots of configuration, I'm not sure that this is the best idea. I don't want to have like 500 lines of code in this single file. So it depends on the use case. But in this case, I think it's, it's nice because previously you had like the program.cs and you had the startup file, so your configuration was a bit split. Um, so I, I basically really like, like this concept. Um, you can also use the minimal API um, to immediately map your requests from your endpoint to some kind of result. In this case, I did a combination of both. So you can actually have the combination of the minimal API and using the old style controllers, or not old style. You can, it's not really old technology there. It's based on your preferences. Um, in this case, I just decided to have separate controllers because I have separate um, use cases. Uh, you can see that there's a configuration controller, there's a logging controller, samples, sensors, and a session. Um, so I, I could put up, get all of the endpoints from those controllers and then list them up here on top of each other, but there's about 20 of them, and 20, I think, is maybe a little bit too, mu too many to, to list here, so that's why I did the combination here. By the way, what are those things? Well, basically, sessions I already talked about. I can schedule a session, I can start a session, I can stop a session, stuff like that happens within the session controller. There's the samples controller, so the sauna itself, or at least the Raspberry Pi itself, will take sample data. It will, every minute, I think, every one minute, it will take the current temperature, the current time, the settings for the current session, and it will store them in the database. And that is um, the data that I can learn from. I know that if the outside temperature is 7 degrees Celsius, that it will take about 45 minutes to get the sauna up until 100 degrees. So I'm keeping that data based on the samples that I got from that sample controller. And then there's the sensors controller. Um, I'm not only interfacing with the, um, with the uh, sauna itself, but I'm also reading the temperature from outside, which is a, with an additional temperature sensor which sits outside, but also the power usage from my home, which is also a sensor that is in my electronic, uh, what do you call it, electronic box um, from, my, from my home. So all of that stuff is inside of that sensors controller. And this is, I'm not going to go any deeper into the API because it's, it's, it's a very simple concept. It's basically just CRUD operations. Put stuff in the database, get stuff from the database, and then have some uh, interaction with those, um, with those sensors. But those sensors are all also very simple. They just have an HTTP server. You can connect to that server and read values from that. So I will not show you that into more detail. Then there's the processor, which is the worker service, and it's the same concept. It's also a top-level program with the same kind of configuration. It also runs a web application, so 
By default, a worker service is just a console application running a worker continuously, but you can also make that into an ASP.NET uh, web application as a worker service. So you basically, you can have a Windows service or a Linux daemon that runs a web server, um, and, you, and you can use it like that. I needed to do it like that because I'm using gRPC. So I have a worker server service running gRPC as a web service. Um, the, if you never heard about a worker service, I think it's a very cool concept. You basically have a class or multiple classes that are your workers and they will do the work. They will do something. I have, in this case, three separate workers that do, will do work simultaneously. I have a configuration worker, which is the, just a worker that every now and then checks for the configuration on the server to see if configuration has changed. Because I can change configuration for my whole setup, like a default session will always be one hour and it will always go to 110 degrees Celsius. So that's, that's default values. But if I change those values on the server, the, the, the client will update it using the configuration worker. Then I have a session worker, which will just look for active sessions. And when there's an active session, um, it will start, um, it will switch that, uh, that uh, heating switch. And then there's a sample worker, which is a worker that continuously looks for temperature samples, and it will send them back to the, um, to the database via the API. These workers are very simple classes. They derive from a background service um, base class, which is part of the .NET uh, base class library, and they have a method called execute async with a cancellation token. So if you install this as a Windows service or a Linux daemon, all of your workers, I have three, you can have as many as you want, they will be executed simultaneously by, by calling this method for you, and then they will keep on running only if you have a while loop. So I have a while loop that says while, my cancellation token is not cancelled. Um, and this cancellation token is actually being used if you run it as a Windows service or a Linux daemon and you stop the service from the interface in Windows or you stop it via command line in Linux, um, then it will cancel your cancellation token. It will not kill your process. So you can listen to that cancellation token. You can basically uh, do whatever you need to do before shutting down in a nice way instead of killing your process immediately. So that's also something nice, I think, uh, from these worker services. If you have a very long running operation here, maybe this takes one minute um, and you stop the service, it will first finish whatever it's doing, then it goes back to the while, the cancellation token is canceled and your service will stop. Um, so in this case, it's the session worker. Let's see what it does. Um, it gets a current active session from the session client, which just connects to that API. And if there is a current session, um, it will update whatever active session there is. If the session was already active, it will just update it. Um, if there was no session active, it will create a new session um, in memory. Otherwise, it will look if there is an active session and kill it. And if it's killed, it will log this. And if there was no active session, it will also uh, log some information. So this is a very simple concept. It, it will do this every, um, let's see, every 10 seconds. Just every 10 seconds continuously, it will look if there's an active session. So basically, I have a Raspberry Pi in my home every 10 seconds asking my API if there's a sauna session. The sample worker, same thing. Every two minutes, I told you one minute, but it's two minutes, it will um, get the current session ID. If there is a current session ID, it will start sending samples. Um, it will check if the sauna is powered, if the infrared is powered, if the temp what's the temperature and what's the timestamp. Something very cool, uh, something cool that I tried to do was basically in the winter time, when I turn on the sauna, it goes very slow. It's, I, I picked a large sauna because I'm a tall guy, so it's like two meters 30, 2 meters 30, 2 meters 30, which is actually a little bit too large, so it takes about 45 minutes to heat up, which is too slow. So actually, in this software, I also turn on the infrared panels until it's 60 degrees Celsius, and then I turn off the infrared panels because that's the maximum temperature for the infrared uh, sensors. So it goes a little bit faster in the beginning um, to get to 60 degrees, um, and then something funny happened in Belgium. Um, the electricity company decided that, we, that they would... Um, uh, ask more money of people if they are using lots of power. So in, in Belgium, from, t from uh, this year onwards, basically every 2,500 watts you are using in every 15-minute frame, they will bill you 50 euros a month if you go above 2,500 watts. If I turn those two 
all together it's 12,000 watts, so I'm screwed. So I need to do some, I need to buy some solar panels or something and a, and a battery, I'm not sure, uh, or I need to turn that off. But yeah, for, up until now it was, it was helpful, now it just costs a lot of money. Um, maybe you want to see how to talk with those um, general input-output ports. It's also very easy to do that. So let's quickly see um, where, where that is. So there's sensors, sauna sensor. So I have, that's not the one. Sorry. Mm. Where is it? This is the one. So the, G, um, the GPIO, um, in this case GPIO ser service is, is the service that I wrote and you can basically on your GPIO controller open a pin for input or output. So a pin is one of those little pins where you can put a wire on top. So you can open it, you have to uh, specify if you're writing to it or reading from it, um, and then you can write high or low values, so ones and zeros, uh, basically. So this is what I'm, what I'm doing right here, and that's, that's basically everything um, you need to know about that. Um, for example, if I, if I do um, turn sauna on, I'm just writing a low value. Uh, it's a little bit counterintuitive, uh, counter um, so it's a low value to turn the, the switch on and it's a high value to turn it off. And that's, that's everything you need to do, basically. So very, very easy. All right, back to the slides. Now, I did this in, in, uh, in Xamarin Forms because I am a backend developer for many years already. I've been doing .NET since 2002, so I loved things like WinForms and WPF. And I basically didn't really look into the whole modern JavaScript world. I know the JavaScript from 10 years ago, um, but today um, I'm not really doing uh, JavaScript professionally. So for me, that's, that's, that's history. So when I want to do something like this, I actually like the fact that Microsoft is thinking of people like me and they created Xamarin Forms, so I can just do the same XAML that I already know to create mobile applications. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, with MAUI, we basically have the same idea. We, we are using full.NET code. We are using XAML um, that is very similar to what we did in, in WPF. And we create one single application that you can target for many different um, platforms. So we have support for iOS, for Android, for macOS, and for Windows. Today, .NET MAUI is available as a, as a preview. Well, actually, it's available as a release candidate today. The second release candidate is there, so it's feature complete. And Microsoft is making it more stable and fixing, bu uh, fixing bugs uh, in order for a release somewhere this year. They try to release it in the second quarter of this year. I'm not really sure if they're going to make that. They are trying to. But in any case, it will be there for a full release with .NET 7, which comes in November this year. So by default, it will be there for .NET 7. Today, it's here for .NET 6 in a release candidate version, which is already officially supported. So you can write your enterprise customer applications using MAUI because it's in release candidate and Microsoft is already, or already supporting that for you. So it's, actually, it's the same idea as, as Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms did the same thing. The only thing Xamarin Forms could not do was target Windows and macOS. So it was actually only targeting iOS and Android. Now it's much more wide, wider. We have support for all those four. And with the next version of, of MAUI and the next version of .NET, there will even be um, additional platforms that we can target, like, for example, um, Samsung uh, Tizen or Tizen, I don't know how to pronounce that, to put your app on your uh, smart TV, which is also uh, very cool. Now, what's the idea here? The idea is that you write your own application code using C Sharp and XAML mainly. Um, and then you have kind of an API layer, which is .NET MAUI. So .NET MAUI has like a base class library, just like the .NET framework or and .NET has a base class library containing lots of APIs that are already there for you to use to talk to all of these platforms. Uh, so you basically talk, your application code talks to the MAUI API, and then the MAUI API will talk to whatever um, target you are targeting or whatever platform you are targeting. 
You always have the option to target the platform immediately. But then, of course, you need to write code specifically for each of those platforms. If you're using the .NET MAUI API, it, it, it should work for all of the platforms by default. But you can override and you can specifically do things for Android or for iOS and so on. Um, this all lives on top of the .NET 6 uh, base class library. And then your application, when, when it gets installed on the target devices, um, it will actually run in these three cases. So for, for uh, Mac, iOS, and Android, it will run the mono runtime, which is an implementation of the .NET runtime. Um, because the mono runtime was already available on those platforms, Xamarin Forms was also using it. So MAUI will just continue uh, that idea. In Windows specifically, it will run a win, uh, native Win32 uh, based on the Windows Win32 APIs. Uh, so it's a little bit different there. And then finally, it runs on those platforms. So let's look at what it looks like. So let's kill everything. So actually, in this project, which is, by the way, available on GitHub, um, I've made a specific version for today, so you can go ahead go to that repository and see all of this code so you can uh, learn from that. Um, but I had a Xamarin Forms application, which, which is still there. And in Xamarin Forms, you had two projects. You had one project containing all the code that was um, that you only need to write once for all platforms. And then you had a project for each platform you're targeting. I am only targeting Android. So that's why there's only an Android project. So this project contains all the native Android code that you need to make it run. And then the phone project in Xamarin Forms contains your C-sharp and your uh, XAML um, uh, user interface code. Now in MAUI, we only have one single project. We have one single project that contains all of your code based on uh, XAML pages just like WPF, looks very familiar if you, if you, if you did um, WPF in the past. So you, here are your uh, pages, and you can do it however you want. You can do XAML with code behind, you can do XAML with view models, whatever um, thing you're already using in other uh, technologies with, with XAML, you can also use them here. But then, very importantly, you have a folder called Platforms, and within this folder, by default, you can have customized code for each platform. And in this case, I am targeting Android and Windows. So not only Android, because now I also have the option to run Windows, and my wife likes to also be able to see the, the temperature on her uh, Windows machine. So now I have these two targets. You get these by default. Um, so when you do file new project and you pick an, uh, a MAUI application, it will create these platform directories for you. And implicitly, the code that lives inside of this or these directories will only be compiled for that specific platform. So I have, for example, specific configuration and specific okay. services that will work differently on Android and on Windows. Uh, if configuration means the configuration values in my app that get stored as part of your application data, in Android, it works a little bit different than it works on Windows, for example. In Windows, I can write to a file. In Android, it gets automatically um, added as part of my application data with, with an other uh, kind of API. I'm also using services, um, a service that I'm actually using, and I will uh, again show you, is that for showing that current track that is playing. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just run the application so that you can see how that works. So I just set the MAUI project as a startup project. And by the way, here you can also see that it targets .NET 6 for Android as a target framework, and the Windows framework is separate. So that's a separate uh, entry, but if you want to also target iOS, for example, you can just put a, a, a semicolon here and then put .NET 6 uh, iOS as a second target framework. The reason uh, Windows has a separate condition on the target framework is because it's a, it's a little bit more complicated uh, there. But you, here you can just list how many uh, frameworks you want to support. And then when running your application in the top, you can choose between those target frameworks. So I have um, frameworks, and here you can see those two. I have .NET 6 for Android, and I have .NET 6 for Windows with that specific SDK version. So if I make the change here, Visual Studio will automatically debug for that specific platform. So now I'm on Android, so if I press play, it will run the application, it will uh, compile, deploy, and run the application on my Android emulator. 
You can also run it on your physical Android device, uh, but I think my wife is in the sauna right now, so I didn't, uh, she didn't allow me to take the tablet with me. Um, so I, I'm using the emulator, but you can also run it immediately on your hardware if you want, even wirelessly through your network. Um, this is what the application then looks like when it actually runs. Um, this is just uh, temporary data. Um, it's not 99 degrees there right now. Um, what I was talking about. Yeah, so when I go to um, another application here, for, for music, for example, I don't have internet, it seems. Let's do Wi-Fi then. Yeah, so basically when I um, play a, a, a music track. This is very specific to Android and I actually have no idea if you can do the same thing on Windows So that's why I separated those services. So on Android I have a media service So let's stop for now. So on Android I have a media service which uh, implements from a broadcast receiver which is a, a, a class very specific for Android. So it, you can see it lives in the android.content namespace So it's, it, it's only available on Android. So this class here because it's inside of that um, Android folder, gets compiled only for your Android target. And then it has a, an, an on-receive um, event, basically, where it receives um, some, some data based on your uh, broadcast receiver. Um, and I'm just asking it for specific properties, uh, like is it playing, yes or no, which artist is playing, which album and which track? And I'm translating this into an object that I'm using myself and then I'm um, calling a callback function that I can listen to from my user interface. So if you look at the user interface for that main page, which is a view model in the constructor, I'm using that media service, I'm re registering a callback and when that callback fires, something changed in the current uh, track that is playing. So if it stops playing, it will return null. So I will just reset uh, the stream to empty. If it is playing something or if you pause or play, whatever, then I will show the artist and the track. So this is, again, specifically for Android. But in your view model, you don't need to care about that. You have a generic media service, which I use an interface for, and I use dependency injection for. So media service is of type um, where is it? iMedia service. So it's an interface. If I run this on Windows, I just have an implementation that does nothing. So on my Windows folder services, I have a media service. And this only has that register callback method because I need to implement it. But it, does not, it doesn't do anything else. So it just, it just doesn't work on Windows. Or at least it doesn't do anything. It works, but it doesn't do anything. Now for stuff like this in MAUI, it's, it's very cool that you have these folders and these folders automatically get only compiled when you are targeting that specific platform. So that makes it easy for us. We don't need to have these, um, these like, if I'm running on Android, this is a piece of code that I need to run. Else, if I'm running on Windows, this is another piece of code that I need to run. I think this looks more, um, more nice uh, for you as a developer. Of course, in some cases, you still need those, um, those if structures, like for example, in my MAUI program, I'm also, by the way, I'm also happy that in .NET 6, all of those templates for all of those different kinds mm -hmm. of applications, um, they look the same. Um, you, you have these um, builders, so it can be a web application builder, in this case, it's a MAUI app builder, but conceptually, it, it all looks the same. In uh, Xamarin Forms, it was very different. In Xamarin Forms, look completely different than an ASP.NET application, for example. And here you can already see these things that I was talking about before. In this case, for um, for configuring my dependency injection, I'm really looking into the fact if I'm running Android or if I'm targeting, if I'm compiling to Android, um, the media service implementation will be the Android media service, which lives in the namespace that is on top. Here, this is the Android media service which lives in this namespace and for Windows, I have this namespace. Visual Studio automatic, also automatically shows you whatever you are targeting right now. So I'm targeting uh, Android, so I can see this in coloring and this is grayed out because currently I'm not configured to compile for Windows, I'm only configured to compile for Android. So it's also very visible to you. Um, 
But for some reason, unfortunately, dependency injection is not enabled by default when you do file new project and you create a MAUI project, but it just works if you, if you add it um, by yourself. And so all of the templates in .NET 6, um, they use dependency injection by default. And so ASP.NET uses this service collection and you can add services to your service collection to do service um, to, to, um, to get in instances of services. You can do the same in, in, in MAUI. So you can add singletons. Uh, if you want, you can add um, transient um, classes if you want. It just works exactly this, in the same way. But you need to do it manually um, if you want to support it. Um, because of that, you have your app.xaml. And in your app.xaml, um, the default code here will show you your main page. So main page is a property on your app.xaml to tell the application what the main page is. So what is the first page you need to show? And you need to put that into um, the main page. By default, it's hard-coded. It says main page equals a new instance of the main page, which does not really use dependency injection. But if you're using dependency injection, you can just add them to your constructor, for, for example. And when, I'm, when the app gets created, automatically these will be resolved from your service collection. So this is not entirely um, good practice at my end, because I have two pages in my MAUI app. I have my general page, my main page, and I have a settings page. So when I open the application for the first time, I need to configure the URL to the API server and a client ID. Um, that is the settings page. So what actually happens here is from the client configuration, I'm just checking if the service base URL is entered or the, 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 the client ID is entered and if they're empty or if at least one of them is empty, I will show the settings page by default and otherwise I will show the main page. So thanks to dependency injection, I can do this. But of course, you already probably already seen it because I'm injecting those pages into my constructor, they're already instantiated. So if I'm looking at that settings page and I'm filling in the settings in the background in memory, my main page has already loaded and it's already running. Um, so that's maybe not a good idea. So maybe I should have created some kind of uh, factory, uh, factory that could create a settings page and a factory that could create a main page so that it only gets created when I actually need it. Because now, yeah, it, 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 it runs in the background. So basically, when the application starts and you don't have any settings, the main page will just throw exceptions constantly because it's trying to connect to the API, um, but it doesn't have any settings to do that. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that is dependency injection. And because you are using dependency injection, if you look at your main page, for example, um, you can do the same thing. Your main page gets resolved um, so you can have a view model, which can also be resolved from the constructor, and now you have a view model, so you don't need to do these things by hand. Your view model also has dependencies, and it will also get those dependencies uh, automatically. Um, so again, I'm not sure why it's not by default implemented in the, the MAUI templates. You need to do it a, a, a couple of changes to be able to do that uh, yourself. Uh, again, in the, you, you can see in the, in the main view model, I have many dependencies. I have even, even have dependencies that I'm not using. Um, but I, there's the media service, there's the sensor client, session client, and sample client for connecting to the API. And there's a timer helper that, I, that I've written to just do some polling, uh, to, to create a polling mechanism. So let's try to run it again. Hopefully I have some connection right now. Not really, doesn't matter. Um, no, doesn't matter. The thing that I actually like about Maui a lot is that, um, is that uh, this thing, what's it called again? Hot reload. Because there's no designer for your pages. So if you open in Visual Studio your main page, there's just XAML. Let's get everything out of the way. There's just XAML, so there is no uh, designer. In Xamarin in Forms, we had a designer and you could use your designer to immediately see whatever it was that you're doing. But I think the designer was not very stable. I think a lot of developers were complaining that 
about the fact that it was not stable, so Microsoft removed it, so problem solved. Um, but now they added hot reload, so you can actually use hot reload to pretty much do the same thing. Uh, sometime, sometimes it works, sometimes it fails to work. Um, I think they still need, need to do some work there, um, but here you can, for example, see if it shows question marks, it means it cannot connect to, to, my, to my server uh, at home, which is maybe not a bad thing. Um, but for example, the, the color, here, non-color, slate blue, it's basically the color when the sauna is off. When I turn it on, it will become red. But if I want to change this color to a very beautiful yellow, for example, I can just change it to yellow, save my file, and it should immediately change in the emulator. As I told you before, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So let's see if I can refresh. No, no, uh, oh, now it does, okay. So maybe you need, uh, to wait some time. Sometimes it goes very quickly. So let's say red. For some reason it doesn't go very quickly right now. And it also works when running it on a physical device. That's actually when I created the application, I ran it on, a, on my physical tablet, which was next to me, next to my laptop, um, and it worked immediately. Very handy to make small adjustments to make sure that your user interface is aligned correctly. So now it worked very slowly. Um, this is also something that I dislike at the moment, that for me the tools are not quite stable yet in Visual Studio. Sometimes I open Visual Studio, I do some work, it doesn't compile, it gives me one million comp compilation errors. Um, at work, when I'm working with students, it's always the same thing. When they have a million compilation errors, restart Visual Studio, and then it works. Um, so it's with Maui, it's, it's, it's even worse. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work and restart Visual Studio and then it, it, it will work. So I'm, ho hope, I'm hoping that Microsoft is able to fix those issues um, when we can get to a first stable version of MAUI. Now to show you one more thing. When you do file new project, file new project, and you search for MAUI, and you're very patient. Okay. Well, basically you have two, I think my computer is, uh, is not helping me here. Um, you have two kinds of uh, projects. There we go. You have the .NET MAUI app, and you have the .NET MAUI Blazor app. So .NET MAUI is the, the default, and that's the one we are talking about most, um, which is in release candidates. But then you also have the .NET MAUI Blazor app. So basically, if you want to do a mobile application in MAUI by using C Sharp code, but you want your front end to be uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you can use MAUI Blazor. Um, so you can write your user interface using the tools that you maybe already know and the frameworks you already know instead of doing XAML. If you're not familiar with XAML and you don't want to do XAML, you can go for the Blazor app. And what it actually does is it will um, create the same exact same kind of, of, um, of MAUI project. So I, I created one just for your pleasure here. Um, I'm not going to use it because I really suck in HTML and CSS. Um, but it also creates a main page for you, a main page that contains a small amount of XAML that you really don't need to change, and it shows a Blazor web view. So basically you have a XAML page that has a web view inside of it, and whatever you are creating um, in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is hosted inside of this Blazor web view. You're doing Blazor, so you're writing Razor um, code. So if I go to my index page, which is now in pages, and I have index.razor, this is your Razor pages, just like you know them, just like you know them from Blazor. Um, and Blazor code has your um, add codes um, little part, which runs C sharp codes. So if you run this kind of application on your mobile device, then this is still doing C sharp. So the C sharp code here will still run as C sharp code by the .NET runtime or the mono runtime. Um, only the displaying part here will be um, will be uh, HTML, 
CSS and maybe a little bit of, of JavaScript that runs in, inside of your Blazor con container. Um, so it does not use Blazor WebAssembly, it uses Blazor server, but then there's no, there's no real server. The server runs in the same application and it just interacts with that Blazor web view. That's, that's the basic idea here. So I try to create the same kind of application. So if I set this as a starting project and I run it, you will see something similar with my very cool um, HTML and CSS skills here. Not really. So I'm not going to use this, so I didn't create the whole application, but this is just your Blazor uh, web view containing your HTML, and in the background it runs um, that C Sharp code. So I did the same thing with that media service. I'm going to try it one more time, running this application. It's already taking too long, so it will not work. I don't have any internet connection, it seems. But it's very similar in what I've shown you before. I have the same kind of media service in my platforms, Android and Windows services media service. And then on the bottom of my uh, Razor page, I have the same kind of, uh, this is like the constructor, but it, this uh, method gets executed when the page initializes. So when the page initializes, I'm using the media service, which I got from the dependency injection. Uh, on top, I'm registering a callback as a Lambda function, uh, and I'm just telling it that the media info um, property in my HTML needs to be changed into the artist and track, and then I change the, st the state of the page, so the page get, gets automatically redrawn whenever this happens. So it's very similar, but if you just like to do HTML and CSS, it's there for you. Just know that um, Maui Blazor or Maui or Blazor Hybrid, um, that, that one is still in preview, so that is not officially supported by Microsoft yet, and many things can still change. Um, so they are actively working on this, but then the, the default MAUI project um, will be their first priority to get that out of the door, and then they will continue working on the, the hybrid uh, Blazor idea. By the way, some, a few things that I didn't really talk about. Uh, I told you that these platform folders, they get created automatically. So basically when you do file new project, you get, you get all of the targets automatically. So I just removed the ones that I, that I didn't want to use. Um, I don't hate Apple, I don't hate iOS, but I've never touched an iOS device or an Apple device in, in, in all of my life. Um, so I just don't need it. So that's why I removed it, because that's less code to look at, less code to actually work on. Um, so you can just delete those um, to, to keep your code as clean as possible. But there's other options. Uh, you can use, of course, these kind of things that I already talked about, like the if Android uh, directive and the else if Windows directives. But you can also name your files very specifically. You can have source, source files with post fixes, for example, like uh, this is a C-sharp file and you have like .android inside of that file name or .windows. And then on your project level, you can actually have uh, additional properties here that tell your compiler or tell the SDK if a file contains the .android um, part in its name, then you only need to compile it for Android. So you can make up your own real rules to specify how you want to, to do that those platform specific pieces of code. So it's, it's fully customizable, um, which, which I actually like. And I think with that, um, that was everything I wanted to tell you. So I'm not sure, do you already have some questions? No questions? It was clear? Okay, perfect. How did I? Ah, yeah, it survived the 100 degrees. Well, the tablet is not inside of the same space. Um, actually, I don't, I'm not sure if I have a photo to show you. Yeah, here. If you look at from the outside, these are tinted windows. And then on the inside, there's, a, there's another window. So there's like one, one meter here with a shower head on top. And that's where the, where the tablet lives. So yeah, it survives. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Why 
Yeah, um, because I wanted to do this very quickly because my wife asked me to do it. Um, and I, I already knew how to work with the Raspberry Pi. And you are quite correct. For the very simple task that I'm doing, switching a switch and reading the temperature sensor, a Raspberry Pi is overkill because a Raspberry Pi is like a full computer. I also have it running a full Raspbian. It's, it's Raspbian without the user interface. So that's one thing already. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's overkill. That's a very good very good statement there. Uh, but yeah, I, I knew how to do, how to work with it. I'm a geek, so I have like 20 Raspberry Pis at home. So I just pick one of those 20, put it in the box and finished. It, don't, it only uses like three or four watts of power continuously. So that's fine. But yeah, I could, uh, I could make that into a, a very specific component that uses even less power. So yeah, you're, you're correct. Any more questions? Yeah. Not yet. No, not yet. So for now, I'm just I'm the the, the code is, is not really intelligent. It just looks at what is the current temperature outside, and it, go, it goes searching the database with just a simple SQL query uh, to see okay when was it about the same temperature, and then it just looks at the lowest value and the highest value within that range. It just looks at the, 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 the time difference. If, if it's 40 minutes, it will start a session 40 minutes beforehand. So when I schedule a session at 6, it will just do the query to the database. It sees it's for this amount of degrees, it's like 35 minutes. So I need to start 35 minutes earlier. So that's it. Um, yeah, that's, but yeah, in, in the future, because for this to work, you already need a lot of data, of course. So if you do a little bit more of, of an intelligent uh, algorithm, you can already um, work better with that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's now running for two years. Um, so I have enough data uh, to know about that because we, we use it about once a week. Um, so I ha we, we have some data. Um, some, some, uh, most, most of the time it works. Unfortunately, sometimes when I open the application, it just has question marks Then I run down. I pull the Raspberry Pi from the plug, put it back in, wait for one minute, and then it works. Yeah, that's, a good, that's actually a good idea. And then I can have to, then I can have all of my twenty Raspberry Pis working together. <laughs> well, there's actually one thing. I do have internet, so I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, but I wanted to show you maybe one one more thing. That is all of all of this code is um, is running. Uh, I'm sorry, all of this code is stored on GitHub. Um, and I have an Azure DevOps um, project for my sauna, for my, my sauna project with pipelines, uh, which I also think is very cool. And my wife uh, thinks it's very cool. I said my wife is tech savvy, so she uses the app and she sees that um, maybe something is not working correctly or maybe she wants to, to, to make specific changes. She can just use her phone and go to my GitHub um, repository, make changes from the GitHub um, user interface, commit those changes, and the pipeline will run. And then, uh, in a, a couple of minutes, it will the new version will be deployed, even to the Raspberry Pi, um, which is quite handy. And for that to work, and now I'm going to show you um, that actually my release failed for the API. But this one is the release for the processor which runs on the Raspberry Pi. This just this is just a very simple pipeline with a couple of tasks that will connect to a Docker, uh, to a, an, an, a DevOps agent which runs on my Synology NAS. So I have a Synology NAS at home for my data, but it also has the, has the option to run Docker containers. So I'm, I'm running many Docker containers there for my illegal movie downloading stuff, <laughs> um, but also a, a DevOps agent. So the DevOps agent runs in my local network, which means I can deploy whatever I want to my local network. So from that agent, I can um, yeah, install a zip thingy on the agent because it's, it's always a, a new agent. Then I can e extract uh, my files to my Raspberry Pi by connecting it. Um, I can stop my running service. So I do a sudo systemctl stop my service. I copy all of those files to the same directory. And then I'm starting um, my, my daemon, Linux daemon again. Uh, so I don't need to really 
do anything manually. I just change the code, pipeline runs, I got a new version of my Raspberry Pi, uh, and it works. Which I also think is very cool um, that we can do stuff like this so easily today. Not only with DevOps, you can do the, basically the same thing with like Octopus Deploy, exact same concept. You can have your agent running as a, as a container on whatever hardware you have lying around at home. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, not, not really. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why I have this, uh, this, this, um, this power usage on the top of the app. That's one thing, so I know that it works or it doesn't work uh, quite immediately. Um, also, one thing that, I, that is configured by default is that when I lose power on the Raspberry Pi, so when I pull it from the plug, all the switches go off automatically. Um, so that's one thing. You can configure those GPIO, GPIO ports, like what is the default value, and it will always return to that default value. Um, so then it's, then it's off. Um, actually, I wanted to do the demo right now to show you to turn it on and turn it off, and that's why I opened up the connection to the outside world, because I'm here, but normally it's closed. Normally I can't use it from outside. I actually want to do some additional author authorization there so that I can, I can use it from outside, but I don't dare to, to do it right now because people like you will probably screw me over and uh, <laughs> will uh, we'll turn it on and turn it off. So yeah, sorry. You're good people, I know. Any more questions? No? All right, then I think I'm done. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope I, I gave you some inspiration with the things that I'm doing at home. Uh, and I would say enjoy the rest of your uh, NDC London. See you guys downstairs for the party. <laughs>